scripture reading will come from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. Genesis chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. I'll read, please follow. Verse 4 reads, So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the Oak of More. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And this is the word of God. Amen. At this time, we'll have our Reverend Andrew Pat come forward and share his message. All right. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. It's always a blessing to come into God's house, right? All right. So today we're continuing in our study of Abraham's life journey. And we're going to be studying about the first three places that he lived in, which is Ur, Haran, and Shechem. So we've heard a lot about uh, what, who Abraham is and what his life means for us. But as we go into detail a little bit about these various places, we're going to go through all ten of these places that he lived in. And we're going to try to connect the ten commands that God gave him along with the ten commands the stoles, and the seven covenants, uh, we will see what it truly means to be a descendant of Abraham, right? So, first of all, Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldeans, right? And what kind of place was Ur? It was a place of idolatry, okay? In Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, It says that when Abraham and his father Terah and his ancestors were living there, they served other gods, right? Other gods, plural. So Ur is a place of idolatry. And this shows us a a characteristic of the world that we're living in right now. Because we're living in a place of idolatry, full of gods, full of spirits that we can't see. And they're all fighting for our mind and our heart, right? Not only that, full of ideas, philosophies, beliefs, and thoughts that are just all out there, right? It's all vying for our minds and our hearts. Abraham lived in such a place. If God had left him there, he would have been like one of those people who had committed idolatry. So God called him out, right? And told him to leave. Depart from your country and your relatives. Because if you remain there, you will succumb to those gods and spirits and thoughts and ideas and ideologies, etc. So for example, look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. This is what Apostle Paul is urging us, right? Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, right? According to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. See, right now in the world that we're living in, Christ is, And his word, his teaching, is just one of many that's out there, right? And they're all vying for our minds. And what we need to do is we need to leave all those things, like Abraham did, and follow only the word and teaching of Christ. That is the living word, that is the true word, that is the word that will give give us salvation. Also in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Apostle Paul once again says, 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. See? Our battle is against spiritual forces, right? Not physical battle, but it's a spiritual battle. Okay? Abraham was born in the same kind of a situation. So right now, we're bombarded with all kinds of ideas and, you know, things, philosophies, teachings. They all sound pretty good, but they all are missing something, right? So really, as God commanded Abraham, the first command that he gave to Abraham was what? Depart, leave these things. That's the first step in our life of faith. So he left Ur, and then he went to Haran, right? What was Haran? Well, Haran was a place of spiritual training. Because here, he met some of the ancestors of faith, like Noah and Shem and Eber, right? So here, he was supposed to be trained up in God's word. But it wasn't just a a place of spiritual training only. Haran was a very rich, luxurious city at the time. It was, if you look at the map, it's at the center, right, where all these places are coming together. So it was a route of trade and commerce. So it was a very rich and extravagant city. So there were temptations there as well. And that's all part of the training. Not just learning God's word, but overcoming the temptation is also part of the training. Right? And so Abraham was to be trained here. But when the time of training ends, you have to leave. And God told once again, God gave the same command here. Depart, right? Or to d- use different words, he said, go forth in, today, or in Genesis chapter 12, right? Go forth from your country and your relatives and even your father's house. Your country, your relatives, your father's house, basically these things denote or signify our comfort zones, right? Our safe zone. You know, we're surrounded by our friends, our relatives, our family members, you know, we're comfortable and we feel safe. But God sometimes doesn't want that because if you feel comfortable and safe, what happens? You feel like you don't need God, right? So God says, get out of there. So God drove Abraham out from there as well. And in Haran were all of these things that held Terah, Abraham's father, back, right? These are all things that hold us back from fully committing our lives to God. So Abraham finally left even his father and went to Canaan, right? So when your training is done, what happens? You get tested. When you get tested, what happens? You don't go into a testing area with your parents, right, or with your teacher, you go alone to get tested, okay? So Abraham had to leave on his own. So now he is really applying what he has learned up to this point in his life. So he finally leaves his father, and he goes to uh, Shechem, the first place in Canaan. So at age 75, he leaves Haran and goes to Canaan. Once he enters Canaan, he thought that God would come and guide him, but he didn't. He was coming down from the north. He came down, and God did not say anything to him. And then finally, when he arrived at Shechem, in today's text, it says that God appeared to Abraham. Okay, God appeared to him. And the word appeared here in Hebrew is ra'ah, which probably means that God appeared in a visible form. For the first time, when he entered Canaan, God appeared in a visible form. 
And what did God say? He said, I'm going to give you and your descendants this land. So Shechem is the place where he first revealed the land that God would give to Abraham. And that land is the land of Canaan as well as Shechem, right? So this is where God first reveals which land God's going to give uh, Abraham. Now, as, as God is leading Abraham from Ur to Haran to Shechem, he keeps, well, before he got to Shechem, he tells Abraham to leave, right? Leave. But when he told him to leave, did, did he tell him exactly where to go? The Bible says no. The Bible just said, go this way, right? So if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says that Abraham departed his country not knowing where to go. Why does God do that? Why doesn't just God say, okay, this is where you're going to go. It's going to take you this long. You have to go like this. Exactly. Why doesn't he give you an exact itinerary of the entire trip so you know exactly what's going on? God doesn't do that, right? God leads us day by day, step by step. That's the problem. So, God said, just go and I will show you. I will tell you. So Abraham did not find Canaan with his eyes. Abraham found Canaan with his ears. Because God kept saying, okay, go to the right or to the left. It's like listening to your navigation, right? Abraham did not find Canaan with his eyes, but he, he found it with his ears. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 as we have read many times, says, for we walk not by sight, but by faith, right? We walk by faith, not by sight. So God did it like this so that Abraham will listen to him every day. Abraham needed to get daily instruction from God. In the morning, he, wake, he, wake, he woke up. Okay, God, so where am I going today? And God told him exactly where he's going to go for that one day only. 25 miles or whatever. That daily instruction. It's sort of like collecting manna every day, right? God led Abraham this way. And this is how God leads us today as well. Sometimes God doesn't show us everything. He just shows us a little bit. Go this way, go this way, right? So that's why it requires faith. Because we have to daily listen to what he tells us and walk accordingly. Why did God do this? Well, in the History of Redemption series, the author says, our author gives a couple reasons. First of all, he did this to show us that it is God who's leading the way and not us. Okay? If God gives us the whole plan, we'll just go on our own, right? Well, bye, God. And take a detour along the way, I, I want to go check out this place and go this way, and then you may get lost, right? But God did it like this so that we will know that it is God who guides the way step by step. So let's look at some of the verses here. Please turn to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. So Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says this. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps, right? We may plan where we're going to go next, but it's God who's going to eventually guide us where he wants us to go. So if you go to verse 3, Proverbs chapter 16 verse 3, this is how we need to live our lives. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. See? First, we have to commit everything to God, and then God will lead the way to fulfill those things for us. Also in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24, it says, Man's steps are ordained by the Lord, 
How then can man understand his way? See, man's steps are ordained by God. So we need to listen for God's instructions and guidance and directions daily in our lives. So it's important that we read and meditate upon his word daily, pray to God daily, as Abraham did, so that we know exactly where we're going. Secondly, God did this to show us that God's guidance is progressive. That means it is, you know, step by step. He doesn't give us the entire thing up front. He shows us little by little. So, for example, in Exodus chapter 23, verses 29 and 30, when the Israelites were conquering the land of Canaan, this is what God said. He said, I'm not going to drive out everybody all at once. Remember, the Canaanites were living there, right? The seven tribes of Canaan were living there, and God told them to go in, drive them out, and conquer the land. And God says, I'm going to drive them out for you, but I'm not going to do it all at once. And the reason he gave is this. He says, I will not drive them out before you in a single year that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. See, when God conquers the land of Canaan for us, he does it little by little. Because if he drives out everybody all at once, it's going to be empty, right? And eventually it'll become desolate or a beast will take over because the Israelites will not have time enough to uh, quickly go and settle in all those lands. This is not just talking about several thousand years ago. This is talking about today. Our life of faith is like conquering our hearts with God's word, right? We are conquering our own hearts today with God's word. But God drives out our enemies little by little so that, you know, we could keep up with that progress, right? We have a lot of problems in us, right? But God starts to solve them for us one by one and so that we could walk with him together as we go along. And eventually, our hearts will be fully conquered and we're going to have the image of Christ in us fully, right? Um... There was this woman, a Korean woman named Kim Wicks. She was a blind orphan. She was blinded during the Korean War. And she grew up in an American, uh, in, a, in an orphanage that was run by American missionaries. So because she was blind, she loved music, she became a singer. And eventually, she sang with Billy Graham in his crusades. And this is something that she said. When a person guides a blind person, you know, a blind person had to be, has to be guided by somebody, right? Because they can't see. When a person guides a blind person, they don't tell them what is 100 feet away. They tell them what's right in front of you. Oh, there's a podium in front of you. There's a step. You have to take a step. Now, there's a door here in front of you. Right, And because the person who guides that blind person is faithful, she says, I always trust them, and they will always get me to my destination. And this is sort of like how God guides us. Because we're all spiritually blind. We don't know what's out in front of us. Okay? And so God guides us like this, just step by step at a time. Go this way. Watch out for that stair, stair or a step. You know, there's a door, etc. And our God is a faithful guide, so we could trust him. Just a blind person, she says, just completely entrusts themselves to the guide because she has no other choice. And when she does, she gets to her destination always uh, without tripping or falling. Our God is the most faithful guide that we have. So I pray that we will trust our lives, entrust our lives into his hands, and he will guide us and get to us, uh, get us to our destination. Amen? 
So that's how he led Abraham into Canaan. And when he got into Canaan, the first place he went to was Shechem, right? And Shechem is located between two mountains. There's a mountain here and a mountain there. This is Mount Gerizim. And this is Mount Ebal. So Shechem is here. And Abraham was passing through like this. On his right was the Mount Gerizim. On his left was Mount Ebal. So later, God says, I want you to place the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the cursing on Mount Ebal as you walk through the land. Now, what does this mean? Well, in ancient societies, the right hand is always the hand of blessing, right? In Israel as well, it was like that. Left hand is always the curse. So as Abraham was walking through Shechem, God is telling them, look, you have blessing on your right hand and curse on your left hand side. Now you got to choose. This is your life. Remember, this is now Abraham on his own, right? Without his father. He's walking by himself with his wife and nephew Lot. There's no one to tell him this is the right way. He's, the, he's now the leader. He's now the head of the household. And so this lesson teaches us what we're going through in our lives as well. Later, when Moses led the Israelites to Canaan, and after Moses died, they entered Canaan, the Israelites were facing the same situation. In the wilderness, the Israelites were led by the pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, and pillar of fire, right? But that stopped before they crossed the Jordan River. Once they crossed over the Jordan into Canaan, the pillar of cloud and fire disappeared. Now the Israelites had to decide on their own. It's like I said, when you go to take a test, what do you do? You go by yourself, right, into the testing room. Now you need to apply what you have learned into the choices that you make in life. And life is a series of choices. Are you going to choose the blessing or the curse? Are you going to choose life or death? That's where we are. That's what Abraham was going through, and he usually chose right, okay? So if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 32, this is what God is saying. Let me read that for you. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 32 says, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today, and the curse if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I am commanding you today by following other gods which you have not known. It shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, that you shall place the blessing on Mount Gerizim, and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not across the Jordan, west of the way, toward the sunset, in the land of the Canaanites, who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, besides the oaks of Moray? Right? So God said, put the blessing on here, the curse over there, so you could get a visual aid. Oh, that's a blessing, that's a curse. Now I'm in the middle here. Which way am I going to choose? This is basically what our life is all about these choices but God says if you place your trust in him he will be there to guide us okay let's all turn to Isaiah chapter 30 verses 20 and 21 Isaiah chapter 30 verses 20 and 21 So Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 and 21 says, Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. 
Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left. You see? This is how Abraham walked because God was always behind him saying in his ear, go to the right or go to the left, this way, that way. And this is how God is going to guide us if we place our trust in him, okay? So I pray that you will fully trust in God by looking to his word for guidance, nothing else. If you look to other things, other gods, other ideas, other philosophies, other people, then God's voice will be drowned out. You won't be able to hear it. We need to place our trust only in God. Then you'll be able to hear his guidance, daily instructions of, on how to live our lives. So this is how Abraham walked. And because Abraham obeyed God along the way like this, God promised that he will become a great nation. And as a great nation, what was Abraham's role? In conclusion, why did God make Abraham into a great nation? The purpose of God granting this bestowal of becoming a great nation is so that he could become a blessing to the world. This, I believe, is the key to Abraham. He's, he's telling Abraham to become a blessing to others. Okay? If you look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says, this is what God told Abraham, right? That now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, right? And then verse 3 says, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. See, that was the purpose of making Abraham into a great nation, so that through Abraham, all the families of the earth, everybody in the world could be blessed through him. And in order to do that, Abraham needs to become a blessing. If you look at that verse there, uh, the last sentence of verse 2, it says, in English, it says, and so you shall be a blessing, right? But in the Hebrew, it's actually an imperative. It just, it means literally, be a blessing. It's a command form. God's commanding Abraham, be a blessing. And that's what he's commanding us today. You need to become a blessing to others. So, for example, we are saved by faith, right? That's a grace. That's a gift freely given to us. It's not from us. We are saved through someone else's obedience, right? Our salvation is given to us as a gift through someone else's obedience. Somebody else had to obey for us, for us to receive salvation. Who was that somebody else? That was Jesus Christ, right? Jesus obeyed by dying on the cross for us. So we receive that salvation, right? And then now, God is saying, now you need to obey. Why? After we receive our salvation, why do we need to obey? We're already saved. Well, because after the salvation, our obedience, when we obey, that will become a source of blessing for others. That's what God wanted Abraham to become. That's what he wants us to become. That's why he called us here. It's not just for the sake of salvation that he called us. Once he saves us, he wants us to do something. And what is that? He wants us to become a blessing to others. So that through our obedience, someone else will benefit. When we obey God's commands to evangelize and share the gospel, when we obey that command, then somebody else will be saved for it, right? Because Abraham obeyed, he became a blessing for his descendants. 
Let's look at two verses and then we'll end today. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Genesis 26, verses 4 and 5. We're going to read these two verses and we'll end today's lesson. So first, let's go to Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. So Genesis 22, 18 says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice, right? Because Abraham obeyed, now through him, all the nations of the earth can be blessed. He can become a blessing because of his obedience. Right? Now let's look at Genesis chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Genesis chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. This is actually God speaking to Isaac, not Abraham. Why did Isaac receive all these blessings? Because Abraham obeyed. Abraham's obedience became a blessing for his son Isaac. So when we obey, it'll be a blessing for our families, for our friends, for the people that are near us. We can become a blessing. And because someone else obeyed for us, we have received this blessing. Jesus' obedience on the cross is the source of salvation for us. Because someone else obeyed and established this church some time ago, now we are being blessed through it, right? So our obedience enables us to become a blessing to others. That's the purpose of our calling. That's why we're here. We need to be a blessing, okay? So this is it right here. This is the conclusion. Abraham's life was a blessing to others. He called us to become a blessing to others. So be a blessing. That's God's command. And the way to do that is through obedience. When we obey God's commands, we can become a blessing to others. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us about Abraham's obedience and how that led to him to become a blessing to others and to the nations of the earth. Father God, we want to be a blessing as well. Please use us and may, uh, may we all become your righteous instruments who will be a channel of blessing to all those people who are around us. So, Father God, our flesh is so weak at times. Even though our spirits are willing to obey you, Lord, it is difficult to do so. God, I pray that your spirit will empower us mightily so that we could truly walk according to your will and obey you at every step of the way so that through our obedience and through our lives, may we be able to deliver the blessing of God to those people who are around us. We thank you so much. We give you all the glory. and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.